Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the interest in making Silicaga a better place. We thank you for each one who has come. You call us in your word. You tell us to pray for those who are in authority, for those who are leading us. And so we do lift them up before your throne of grace. We thank you for their service, for their hard work, and we pray that you will give them uh, wisdom as they speak and as they address the issues that have brought us together tonight. Lord, I thank you for each resident of this town. We all want Silicon to be a better place, to be the place that you want it to be. And so, Lord, we pray that you will just guide us in this meeting tonight, in this town hall meeting, as we discuss issues and concerns and as we discuss potential solutions to those things. Help us to be part of the solution. And Lord, we pray that, that you will just be with each one of us, all of the things that we say and the way that we say them, that together we will work to make this a great town, a better town, to deal with every issue that arises. Thank you for this time together. May this be a wonderful meeting tonight. We ask it in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome everybody to First Baptist. Thank y'all for coming. Uh, hope you get some good information out of this meeting. Um, thank you to the senators, uh, Lance Bell, Keith Kelly coming out. We have represented Ben Robbins, uh, Mr. Steve Hurst here, and uh, Philip Marsh from the County Commission, uh, along with other representatives. So tonight you'll be hearing from some of them. Uh, Senator Lance Bell and Keith Kelly will speak, as well as uh, Representative Ben Robbins. Um, they're going to speak, give you all the information they have on the higher state level, and what they can uh, inform us about. And afterwards, they're going to sit up here and have a Q&A session. So if you have a few questions, a question each, there's two microphones here. Y'all welcome to come up and ask your questions. And then they have microphones, and they'll answer whomever's fit to answer that question. Uh, thank you all, and thank you guys again. So y'all can come on up. For those that don't know you, my name is Lance Bell. Last week, I'll tell you, me and Keith Kelly traveled to the border, a more of an education, fact-finding trip. That's my second trip down to the border. And as I come back now, I still have more questions than I do answers. I'm not going to, it's a sad situation. I'm going to give you some numbers real quick. Since this parole program started, um, you've had 111,000 Cubans 214,000 Haitians, 96,000 Nicaraguans, 121,000 Venezuelans that have come to the border under this parole system. Out of that number, 110,000 Cubans have been granted parole, 210 Haitians have been granted parole, 93 Nicaraguans have been granted parole, and 117 Venezuelans. For a total of 530,000 that are here in the United States, have been granted parole. 530,000. That's a scary number. Let's, let's understand what they are. They're not here on a legal status. They're here in a lawful presence that's been, basically their status has been deferred by the federal government. They're a protected class. The one thing I think uh, Keith Kelly will tell you the same as me is those two words Scary that they are a protected class. What does that mean? That means there's nothing that Silicaga can do. There's nothing that Talia County Commission can do. There's nothing that the state of Alabama can do because of what the federal government has allowed to happen. Um, I promise you, we will not leave here tonight. There's anybody that's got a question, I want you to ask the question. But you're probably going to be as frustrated as I think we are. There's a lot of questions we don't have answers to. We're still trying to find those answers. Um, I want somebody to ask about the vetting process. That's something I want you to ask tonight when we start having questions. Ask us about the vetting process because I had the opportunity to talk to one of the guys from Border Patrol and he explained the vetting process. But also I think once um, we're explaining to you about the NGOs, which is a non-government organization, 
these charities that are down there. And I'm gonna tell you, they're a money laundering operation is all they are. They are a legal, allowed by the federal government, a money laundering organization. Because they're not only taking advantage of the citizens here, they're taking advantage of these people coming across the border also. Um, I'm gonna sit down and then let Keith will come up and say a few words like Ben, and then we'll come here. I think y'all got so many questions. I just feel like it'd be better that y'all ask the questions and let's do the best we can do. Um, main thing is I appreciate the First Baptist allowing us to use the church tonight. Um, and we'll give you our phone numbers for you leave tonight. If you have a question, call. This won't be me. We'll, we'll be glad to do what we can do. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm Keith Kelly, and it is an honor to be here. Anytime you can come to God's house, it's an honor even when it's with a difficult situation or one of neighborhood concerns. I think uh, when we gather in God's house, it can kind of help shape the conversation, maybe the direction it really needs to go. Uh, as Lane said, we've been at the border, and that was an eye-opening experience. There, we saw things going on there that you're not seeing on your national news. Uh, it will terrify you and it will change your life once you see it. These Border Patrol agents have their hands tied. They're frustrated. Uh, they're dealing with things that uh, they have to go home each night and see their wife and children and realize what they've seen and dealt with that day. And it's a lot to deal with. Uh, things I won't get into too much today. But when you talk about Border Patrol, you talk about the different agencies and the complexities of this that we're having trouble with navigating, I think there's roughly about seven agencies that deal with different aspects of immigration. There's about 180 to 85 work permits, visas, different type of programs that people can come to this country legally on to work in different programs. Agriculture, you see it quite a bit. They come in, uh, they're coming in for a certain period of time each, each year, help get the crops in or whatever the case may be, and then they go back home. And on many times, it's the same ones coming back year after year. When you look at uh, some of the frustrations that's going on, you've got, as Lance said, you've got those that are here legally, and that's primarily from what we found out what we're dealing with here. And then you've got those that are, that are illegal. So the vetting process is very important, but when you get there uh, and you get down to the border and you find out, you know, a lot of them don't even know who their sponsors are gonna be. They're supposed to have a sponsor that looks out for them, that helps them, gives them direction so that they know what to do, what not to do. Coming from different cultures, Venezuela was mentioned. Uh, it's a communist country, so you can't just deport them back there. They won't take them. So you've got a lot of different dynamics there, not just speech, uh, those types of things as well. But one of the things I think that's important, uh, we've all sent letters, including uh, uh, Senator Tupperville and Senator Britt and Congressman Rogers. We've all sent letters to the President and uh, to uh, Homeland Secretary Morales asking for relief to show us, to educate us, to help us know where people are coming, how they're tracking them, if they are, whatever the case may be, because you're supposed to be tracked. When they come across, they're getting money. Roughly, some are getting as much as $5,000, uh, food stamps, and telephones. Telephones, we're told, are designed to call in to their uh, sponsors so that they can give their reports on where they're at. But basically, President Biden uh, or uh, Vice President Harris could do an executive order with one signature and solve this problem we've got right now. One signature, and uh, then we just have to look at what who can stay and who can't from that point. So that's one of the things that we kind of got into that we tend to forget. How do you fix the problem? When we talk to even the border agents, um, we fix the problem on how you vote in November. Uh, that seems to be where it is. You make a decision then as to whether th this type of behavior will continue or not. 
in my view, it also looks like in the federal government, we got in the human trafficking business. There are the, a lot of these folks that are victims. They're dying on the way over here, including women and children mainly. Horrible things are being done to them, and they never make it. I think the thing you've got to remember in all this is no matter how many times or you hear negative things about our town or our state or our country, whatever it may be, however bad you may hear, these people are risking their life to get here to what we enjoy every day. God has blessed this land, and he's blessed us, and these people want a taste of it. They're willing to risk their lives here for it. I think we have to be responsible in what we do. Councils, commissions, the state legislature, our hands are tied to a large degree. Now we can do some things legislatively and we're gonna work on a, a package of bills to try to help with some of the things that can be done. Major legislation was passed, I think it was in 2011, roughly around 10 to 12 years ago. Uh, immigration reform in Alabama was the toughest in the country. Federal courts struck down much of those laws then that are no longer in place. But we look forward to hearing your questions today. It is important that we hear what you have to say because that may help us knowing what other questions to ask. Just before the meeting tonight, I talked to Congressman Rogers, Rogers' office and uh, to see if there was any, uh, late, the latest news, if they had anything recent come up. What that office has to do, and I'm talking about a U.S. Congress from now, had to put in a form ask specific questions and submit that form to the Department of Homeland Security to get answers. Something wrong with that system. Something wrong with that process. So, I don't know that we're going to have the answers you want to hear tonight, but we'll be glad to tell you what we do know. But I think it's important you share with us your thoughts and what you see, because that will help us know what questions to move forward. And uh, I think that, you know, if some of you want to know what we what we saw at the board, uh, at the border, you know, we'll be glad to tell you as well about that. But we thank you for being here. We thank you uh, for your love for your community, and we love it too. Thank you. Well, I want to thank First Baptist for allowing us to be here. And I um, want to reiterate some of the points that were made, but no reason to belabor what's already been said. So I'll, I'll try a little bit different, but still on the same territory. That um, I want you know, Representative Steve Hurst is here and our two senators from Talladega County. So as a delegation, we were all working together. And just as Senator uh, Kelly talked to Congressman Rogers' office, just Maybe two hours ago, I talked to Senator Britt's office to get more information and figure out what's going on. And it's the same thing with the U.S. Senator. They can't get answers. They're struggling to find out what's happening. But Who are you, sir? My, I'm sorry. My name is uh, Ben Robbins. I'm the state representative for District 33. That's uh, part of Talladega County and all of Coos County. So I, I'm sorry. But I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself. That was a uh, uh, a faux pas on my part. So, but thank you for asking. I'm sorry, I should have said that right away. Um, what I can say is that it is a struggle to find answers. And I think everyone wants answers. But the problem is we don't have anything definitive that we know. So even when we talk about the CHDN program or parole program, we can't definitively say that every single person that is an immigrant in this community came in under that program. They could have also come from an asylum program. They could have come from another program. So it is impossible, and I think we should preface everything we say today, that nothing is a definitive statement. And when you say that, I want you also to understand that the federal government has created chaos. It is chaos at the top. It is chaos in which they communicate, that they are unable to monitor, and they're unable to deal with this problem they have created. And it, imagine a river that flows downstream. Well, our community is downstream from the federal government. So it has created chaos here locally. It has created chaos in the way in which we communicate with each other. It has created chaos in the way in which we actually are having conversations and dealing with one another. And that is because of the void of leadership that we're seeing from the federal government. So I say that to say, do not allow the federal government's chaos to cause us 
to become toxic. We must work with each other and together to solve this problem as best as we can. As Senator Kelly said and Senator Bell said, our hands are tied to a certain extent, but there are things that we still can do in the state legislature, and we will do everything to the fullest extent that we can. And I feel confident from conversations that uh, I've had with the two of them and a conversation, a Zoom call we had earlier today with my fellow House members, that we will come with one of the most comprehensive package of bills related to immigration that a state has. We will develop monitoring systems within our state for parolees, and we will be able to know where they are and who they are, and we will hit and go after those sponsors, those sponsors that have failed these individuals. I think it's very important that we understand that when we talk today, as both Senator Bell and Senator Kelly said, we are talking about human beings. And that anger that you feel, the frustration that you feel, is at the federal government, not at these individuals. And these individuals have been put through a system that is unfair to them, that is unfair to our local community, because we don't have the resources to support them. And these sponsors that were supposed to do these things have not done them and have failed them. And they have sold these individuals a bag of goods that is not true. And I think you should all remember that. And then we should also remember that us as a community are now tasked with doing the responsibility that these NGOs, these sponsors said they would do and signed a contract with the federal government to do and they failed. They didn't just fail. It's a money make. I would say it's money laundering and it's a pyramid scheme. The pyramid scheme is instead of selling you product, it's selling human beings. All they care about is the number of human beings they get into this country and they dump in other places because they make more money off those bodies and they do not care what happens to those people. And they do not care what community they cause problems in and what chaos they cause. And I think you need to remember, it is chaos and that is coming down from the very top to us. And we are indicative of every community across this country. It is just pure chaos. But we can do everything we can to stay united and move forward. The key is looking forward and doing the best we can. So thank you all, and I'll be happy to answer any questions along with everyone else. So I think it's clear that we need to understand that no one single industry brought them here. It's, we are separate and different than Marshall County and other than Coffee County, where it was one sole industry that brought them here to work. We don't have that same fact pattern. So we are unique, and that's what makes this situation so difficult, is every, every situation is different and unique in and of itself. She asked, she asked, I heard they were working at the, uh, Did she, just she asked, that? she said, where are they working at a chicken plant in Ashland, true or false? And that was the question. One, one thing to keep in mind with all this is social media has gone up and there's rumors everywhere because we spend a lot of our time trying to wade through all that that's taken an enormous amount of time. When people are putting suspicions there, you know, I remember one thing was two buses. There's two bus loads coming here. That was a high school football team headed to, to show the football game. And, you know, that was on social media. They're busting in, they're busting in, but it didn't show you getting them off where they got off. Well, I spent two days tracking that thing down to find out it was a football team. Two days we could have spent on trying to find more information on this. So I would encourage you with the social media, you know, 
uh, be guarded in those. If you know something, that's great. That's great. But it really would help us because we're watching, we're listening, we're trying to get to the bottom. Yes, sir. Uh, you said you guys were on the border. Uh, to get here from Haitian, uh, you're not going to be walking that way. So the air transportation from Haitian, uh, do you have any idea how they were transported out of there? We got a briefing um, from Border Patrol. And this is one of the things that made just about everybody in the room sick. And there were legislators and sheriffs from all across the United States. They showed us a video that's being played in some countries. And it's a coming to America video. It's like a commercial, what we have on TV is commercials. And it's showing us glorious life in the United States. And telling you, if you want to come to the United States, call this number. Well, you call the number and then they tell you, okay, per person it's gonna cost you X amount of dollars and it shows a glorious travel to the United States. That's not what really happens. They, they pick you up, whether it's in Cuba, Venezuela, Haiti, Nicaragua, they basically pick you up and get you part of the way there. You've sold everything you have in your possession. Your family, you've saved everything you could and it's anywhere from $7,500 to $10,000 per person is the average, what they tell us the average price is. They get you on a boat and they take you to a point around Mexico. And then from there, <clears throat> you're thinking on the video, it's a real nice travel. But from there, that travel don't exist. A lot of it is walking, a lot of it is tough. Um, a lot of people don't make it. For that 530,000 that are here, I would hate to know the number of people that didn't make it. That's why after the briefings, off, we're going, this is human trafficking. There's been these, these NGOs are taking advantage, these talents are taking advantage of these people also, and a lot of them didn't make it. So that's, the commercials would, would actually turn your stomach that they showed us when we were there, what, what's, what's being played in these, these countries. You're being very careful in not identifying those NGOs, I've noticed. Uh, one thing, let me expand on it back on that. So, you know, Lance mentioned at the, the amount of money it's costing to come over here. So you can pay, pay it up front. But believe it or not, you can come on credit. Now think of the kind of money that we're talking about and where they're coming from. How many of are going to have that kind of money? So what basically if you're doing, you're coming on credit. So you're coming here and you're basically in servitude until you pay that debt off. I mean, it's human trafficking no matter how you stack it. And our federal government, we got veterans that died protecting our borders and keeping us safe. So the wars are falling on other areas and here we've opened the door and let them in. So I think it's important to remember just because they're here doesn't mean they had the money to pay it because they may still be working it off. And, and these sponsors that we're talking about, they, uh, there's a, if you'll have someone that's talking to them between the sponsor and there, because they won't talk directly to them. So who knows how long they have to work or what they have to do to get those. But you guys are pretty sure all, all the funding is coming from the individuals and not from another source. Hey Lance, one, one second, excuse me, but when y'all can to make things flow better, come up here to the mic and ask your questions. We're back here, news media, live stream from here, and I'll answer better. I'm gonna walk over and show you, but the one that we got to visit, is Catholic Charities RGB for Real Things Island. And I will tell you, that is a money making operation. Um, the sheriffs got up and basically said they're going to cross the border and help you do the CBP one out. You do the out, they charge you $1,500 to do the out. Then they, they're back across the border and then they come in. ICE and Border Patrol will process you. And then they end up, once they get you processed, give you your phone, give you your money. Then they take you to, this is one of the main places. They have four hotels rented in McAllen. Four full hotels they have. They take you there, then the federal government writes them a check for $1,500 per person. They process there. Well, the people have already paid them $1,500. So they're making $3,000 per person there. And I will tell you, um, the federal it, government makes the federal government is also paying them. You look it up; they've already paid them over seven million this year, over to that one charity.
the thing when they when they're coming in uh, where we were there and there were there were people in there from uh, all different countries there across the street is the bus station so what they're doing when you come in there, we asked them who their sponsor was. They didn't know. So we asked Catholic Charities, we asked, well, who do you sign sponsors? Do you sign sponsors? And they said, well, no, ICE does that. That's where it goes back to what I said before. You've got these different agencies that do different things. So what happened out of that is they wait and that sponsor will spend, I mean, that, uh, that sponsor will send some money for a plane ticket or a bus ticket. And who knows where they go? The ones we were talking about, talking to uh, when I first got there, they were headed to Chicago. So, good evening. Um, City Council, Mayor, gentlemen, thank you for coming. Um, I have a couple of questions for clarification. Um, first one being, uh, what is the parole status that you referred to? Well, I can answer that too, but I think. And like I, I prefaced everything with, I think it's important to remember we cannot definitively say how every single person is here. So from having talked with a few patients that live here or here in Silicaga, the parole program is called the CHNV program, Cuban Haitian Nicaraguan Venezuelan. Uh, it is a status that you get which allows you into the country, which delays your actual hearing on your immigration status but it gives you a work permit which allows you to work. So technically you have a delayed status, but you have the right to work within this country. Okay, so it has nothing to do with criminal activity. Don't, don't get confused with parole being like our parole is when you serve prison and you get out. It's, it's not the same thing. Right, that's well, what I was getting And I also think it's important to clarify is that there are many different ways in which people on the parole program come into this country. They come in by air travel, which is the majority come in through air, some across the border. They come in by ship. They come in all different ways. All they have to get to is a point of entry into the United States and then fill out their form. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm sorry, sir, but he's, he's asking a question, so let's. Well, what we're saying is true is we witnessed it. Well, we were there. So we were there. Yeah. 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 And just because what you're saying is it does not mean they're going to hold them for I think you're referring to, in some cases, the wet foot, dry foot program. That's what it used to be. So the Cuban, so it used to be the wet foot, dry foot for a Cuban. That's, that's the same, the similar program has been expanded. So it used to be that if you were Cuban, and you, that's why I remember in like the 80s and the 90s, you'd see those shanty boats making their way to the Florida Keys, that as soon as a Cuban put one foot on American soil, they were good. Yes. So we've expanded, in essence, that program. So it is similar to the wet foot, dry foot program that was, we had for Cubans. The whole reason was because of the Castro regime. So what the federal government done, has done is, in essence, because, because we have so many asylum seekers and so many people putting pressure on the border, Another point of entry, we've kind of modified the parole program, which has been in existence for years, with the wet foot dry foot program and with an asylum program. So it's very confusing. I think one of them said it's word salad. It's trying to figure out what a work verb is, what a work piece is, and I'll go back to the word I kept using. It's chaos. It just creates chaos. You don't know, like, if you're talking about an old program that merged with a new one, there's a work piece, it's just terms, and people can't comprehend what these terms all mean. Maybe on that one, I wanted clarification because you said parole being in America, we think of parole as one right. thing versus right. what it is for the State Department. So um, my next question is, um, the numbers that you said that are coming through, are all of these numbers are in relation to the southern border? They, these are the parole system. The, the, these are the parole numbers that are coming through. This don't count the illegal crosses. And this is just the parole numbers that have come through from those four countries. Just for us, so just for those four countries. Okay, so we're, none, of, none of the things that you're addressing includes any of our other borders. Correct. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. To, to try to help clarify what this gentleman was saying back right here is it may be a violation that's supposed to kick them out of the program, but they're not getting kicked out of it. You know, it's just like coming here illegal. It's illegal to come here, but they're still coming. So the, the, they are violating that, but they're not being held accountable. That's what I was trying to express. 
how you doing? Appreciate you being here. I'm, I'm a bottom line kind of guy. So we're talking about over a half a million legal immigrants that we're having to deal with now. Correct. These are not illegal. Correct. You're telling us that your hands are tied. Our police department's hands are tied and our citizens are tied. We can't do anything until November 2nd. Is that pretty unless, much the jazz? Yes, sir. It is unless they violate a criminal law that's on the statute of assault or DUI, any criminal law that we currently have. They are technically a protected class and there's nothing we can do because they are taking a protected class. And you can't stop ID, they got a backpack, can't speak English, they can, nothing you can they do. They cannot treat them any different than they treat me, Ben, or Keith, or any of you. We can, they cannot, let me say something. If the police department went and did something different, I believe the, I believe the U.S. Attorney's Office would come down on them. I mean, it's, it's not something that you gotta treat them the way we're all treated. All right. Well, I appreciate y'all. Love you. Love this town. Love these citizens. Police department. And we'll just hold on to November. Just be afraid about that. Amen. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I'm leaving. Good evening. My name is Shirley Walker. And my first question is, Aren't we here to talk about Solacaga and how every this Haitian situation affects us as citizens in Solacaga? <laughs> then to start a conversation with this community to get us compassionately relating to each other, to start the conversation with terms like, oh, it is very scary. And these numbers with 530 people, a thousand people coming in as parolees and one million immigrants coming into the country and the border and, and talking about what the United States has or has not done. That, to me, is setting a volatile tone for, for the citizens here. And we still haven't found out what's happening in Silicon and how this all affects us. Because when you continue to say things like these uh, and they, whoever they are, and you say, so we are like every other community across the country. We are inundated with with immigrants, and we, I still don't know who's in Silicon and how it's affecting us. Well, I'd be happy to answer the question. I think you, you raise a really good question. Um, and I think you're right, and I tried to say some things earlier to clarify that, you know, the language we use is important. The language which you use the way you talk about your fellow human being is important. And we need to make sure we always use language that we, we've got to make sure we just use the correct language, correct terminology. But I think what everyone was trying to say is that they're kind of what I said at the beginning. This is a problem that has gone downstream from the federal government. So what we are dealing with in Silicaga is a downstream effect. And so I think starting with saying, here's the problem at the top, and now here's what we're dealing with here. And I understand your concern about saying, but, but what I'm trying to say is we don't need to divide ourselves. What we need to focus on is we do not know how many are here. We do not know an exact number. And we cannot say definitively what program they entered this country in, where they entered the country. And that is, that is an answer that we will probably never know. We will never know that information. But what we can do is we can look at what is a state we can do in terms of creating our own monitoring system, work with our local city, and whether it be Silicaga, it be Chillsburg, it be Bell City, it be Aniston, we all work together because that's where we're gonna grow and how we're gonna be strong. But if we continue to you know, fight with each other, I don't think we will step forward and we will continue to be in this vicious cycle. Exactly, that's why we need what's happening in Silicaga. So we that sounds like to me there was um, a concern about immigrants, Haitian immigrants in Silicaga and how it affects our city and so forth. I haven't heard us talk about well, I can it. Tell you, I can tell you about a few Haitians that I've talked with and I can tell you about Haitians that I've met 
they are victims. They are victims in a vicious system that we talked about. It was a, it was a broad macro level view. If you want to get down to the micro level view, they have been victims within a system they never should have come here to begin with. It was unfair to them to come to a place where they were told there would be jobs when there were no jobs for them. How is that fair to a person? So what we can say is the church is working to try to teach people English. They are providing that bridge that that sponsor should have done. That sponsor, whether they flew in to the Orlando airport, the Miami airport, or across the border, that sponsor is supposed to do that. And the church is stepping up and doing that. So the immigrants that we have here. How many? Do we have to well, because the federal government cannot give us that information, we cannot say, and I would not say a number, and I don't think anyone in the state would give you a number because we can't, we can't even do that. If I was to guess, it would cause a problem because I would guess, or any of us would guess too low, too high, and then. But we are creating a problem. We are saying there is a problem when we don't even have any facts or any information to say there is a problem. And, and people are talking about the they're having the jobs, they're taking the food. Well, what we are talking about is that there are Haitians here. And I'm not saying that there is a problem the way you're saying it. All I'm saying is there's a problem and a lack of information. A lack of information that we can give you. You had a question. You came to ask a question. If I can't give you a definitive answer, how can I answer your question? So did I say there was a problem or not a problem? That's for anyone to decide whether or not there is a problem based upon a set of facts. The problem is I cannot give you a set of facts for you to make a true determination. So without that information, how can you truly say there's a problem or not? What I can say is that we do not know information that the federal government will not give it to us and cannot give it to us. And to me, that is a problem. That is a problem that you as my constituent could ask me something. Look me in the face and say, how many Haitians are here? That was a question that you asked. Right? You asked that question. You said, how many Haitians are here? And I can't tell you. Did anyone on the stage say we didn't want Haitians here? Did anyone say that? No. But what we can say is that we just cannot give you the basic facts. So what we can do is we can look at legislation that would tell employers, when you hire a parolee into this country, you must notify us. And what you can do is then we would know. So to answer your question, to answer your question and the fact, the statement that you made, it creates certain problems. Like, one, what do we do when we have to hire second English second language teachers, like Marshall County? If we have to do that, we don't have the resources, but if we knew where a Haitian or a Nicaraguan or Venezuelan were located, we could then reallocate resources in the state to supplement a board of education that needs a teacher. And so that's what, that's what, we're talking about here. It's a it's a, it's a need to allocate resources. The city council meetings that I've seen have been present have been just people have been kind of very upset about supposedly about Haitians who are doing whatever they say they are doing, and there is no proof that that's so. So that's why I'm that's my concern. If and when you use terms scary, like oh it's scary. And, and, and it's terrifying, and this has happened to cities all over the country. And I appreciate if you're not campaigning here, because you know you keep saying the federal government hasn't done its thing, hasn't done its thing, and we keep talking. I don't, I know the trickle down theory that things happen, you know, and come down the line. But we are still talking about in Silicaga what our difficulty is. How do we get citizens working together, and how do we welcome people when they come to the city? and not consider it a problem, it is not a problem. That's my question. That's my question. And, and I think every, every question I've had, every question I've had from a phone call here has been, how did they get here? What's the process of them getting here? And how did we wake up one morning and they're here? They The Haitians. That's what I mean. I mean, I don't know. I, every phone call I've had that has come from Tallinn County has been, tell me how they got here, tell me what they're doing here, and that, I'm trying to, that's what I've been trying to find those answers out. I don't know those answers. I do not know, it's like many people said, we don't even know that they're, they're on the pro status. I'm like him, most of the ones here, when I saw how they're brought here, it really upset me, the way they're treated. I'm telling you, the way they're treated would upset you. One of, one of the things that, one of the things that we tried to do tonight is let you know how we got here. That, give you some background of how we got here. That's what we tried to do by telling you what we saw at the border, those kinds of things. 
-hmm. So you understand why, how they got here and some of those policies and things. Now, I'm not, we're not up here campaigning or anything like that. And, you know, and the federal government policy, you know, the president sets the policy, the policy is the policy. They can change that. You know, we can't control that, but that is whatever, whatever it is, is what it is. But one of the reasons we've given you the background that we've given you is so that how you, so you kind of understand how we got to this point. Mm -hmm. Now, um, everybody's searching for questions. You've been going to your city council, your county commission, us as your legislative delegation, you know, your state and federal officers, and you're wanting answers, and we're doing our best to get there, but we've got, we're, we found out where we got to go to to try to get them, but they're not giving them to us. So what we try to do is, I guess, paint a picture there of what we're trying to do. Is I understood that you were trying to paint a picture. My concern was how you started to paint that picture. You started in a negative form format. When you when you started, I wrote down it was setting a negative tone because you started talking about the border and all the problems that are at the border and the, these are people coming here. They're parolees and and um, the they are under protective and it's very scary. We all spoke first and it's very scary. You know, but you're setting up people to, 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 to be upset. The second person, Mr. Kelly, who spoke, said, kept talking about how terrifying it is. The people can come as a work program, they can come, and they're getting monies, they're getting, somebody said $5,000, they're getting phones and getting food stamps and so forth. You, you, these kinds of things are not giving us facts about the, the Haitians and who are here and so forth, but you're giving us this information that to me just uh, it incites um, um, people's anger. Yes, ma'am. I respectfully dis disagree with some of that was my comment, some of it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But somebody asked earlier about, uh, earlier before we started about taxpayer money. Well, they got, the funds that got were paid with taxpayer money. The money on the food stamp card was paid to the taxpayer. I mean, you've got a right to know where the money's coming. That's not saying you agree or disagree with it. That's just telling you how they got it and, and how they got here. That's all that that was about. It's not trying to paint a picture of, of uh, extreme negativity or anything like that. It's painting a picture of reality of, of kind of what, what's been dealt with. Uh, I want to tell you something that is scary. Mm -hmm. This time last Tuesday night, Dr. Vickers Ranch in Brooks County, Texas, we were on a side-by-side -side riding around. In Brooks County, since 2021, on those ranches right through there, where Dr. Vickers Ranch is, 246 people have been found, women, children, men, dead out there coming across, trying to bypass the illegal side. The illegals are trying to bypass. It's scary when these farmers are out there and they're coming across that's the scary part. I'm not saying we're, it's scary that, that they're here. It's scary there's so many unknowns. Yes, I was still thinking, it tore my heart out going across that ranch. It tore my heart out going into that Catholic shelter and talking to a woman from Venezuela. She had a baby eight days earlier and, come, and had that baby here in the United States and talked to her. She has not where to go. She has no, has no idea where she's going. But I understand, but there are uncertainties among the regular citizens Amen. and things that happen. But the last thing is, this is not a border state. You keep comparing this to a border state. And so, but it's not, but we, there's a border state, in, but, but it's not Texas. It's not the stories that you're telling. That's not us. We just want to hear about us and how this affects us and where do we go from here. I disagree with you Every state is a border state under these policies. When you go 530,000 people out into the United States in a three and a half year period, we're all border states. We've got a highway system. If you're here from anywhere, and we also have the border down there at the coast, we forget about that. But when you have our highway system, you can. You look at I 10 and where people are coming in there. And then they spread out. So I respect this, but we are a border state. Uh, I think some of the the uh, lack of policies that we have now on immigration across the border has made almost every state a border state to some degree. I understand what you're saying, and I don't mean to belittle that now. Uh, it's just it's uh, 
It's just a different perspective.